There's a lot of times where I've noticed that a company is not true to who they are, or they inflate themselves to be something that they're not, or even individuals. I know many people that they want the faster things in life, so they want to look like they have nice cars, they want to look like they have all these things that they honestly don't have, so they brand themselves as somebody who has all these things, when in reality, that's not a thing that can last. Is what I'm assuming. Oh, not with not. a company. All comes out in the wash. Yeah. It all does. Right now, we have two very, very special guests. We have Brandon, uh, and then we have Justin. Brandon and Justin, tell us a little bit about your story, what you guys do. I know you guys are in the same company together. Um, and then you have had a very nice journey yourself starting these companies. Um, so tell us a little bit more about that and how it started. My goal has always been to serve people. Um, okay. I started my first company actually when I was a kid. It was actually mm -hmm. out of... A desire to have a trick bike. Okay. I had a mountain bike, a race bike, and I, but I wanted a trick bike because everybody else had one. Okay. And um, we had that was just when com color computer and color printers just just came out, mm -hmm. and my parents said, "Let's, you know, if you want to make money, you want to make that bike, we'll give you fifty percent of it, but you got to come up with the rest. You got to mm -hmm. figure it out." And so I started a landscaping company. Okay. And I went on the computer. I created a, a flyer and I passed it out to the entire neighborhood and. Um, made enough money to okay. buy that trick bike. Unfortunately, that trick bike, I didn't take care of it. Uh, okay. And probably as soon as I got it, it became a rust bucket in the back of the yard. Mm -hmm. um, but that was my beginning. Okay. Uh, then when I graduated high school, I started a company called Two and Excess LLC. Two and I the two and XS. Okay, two and XS. All right. Yeah. I hope that's uh, and not a um. <laughs> it was a d distributorship for turbo turbonetics and uh, spherical intercoolers. Mm -hmm. uh, we were part of the Nopi race circuit, worked, worked with Lisa Kubo, Fred Ellis, um, and just raced up and down the East Coast. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, that went belly up. Mm -hmm. um, and I had to get a job. I got in the car business uh, and loved it. It was my life. and But there was always something missing. Right. And so I decided to um, make a change uh, after making a, tr making a trip uh, mm -hmm. to Africa. And um, that was the beginning of my first, com my first real official company that actually survived, lived, okay. uh, which was Northlight Group. Uh, okay. It was a consulting firm. And, and when, when was this start to interrupt? When did you go to uh, Africa? Uh, when, they, when Kenya promulgated the Constitution so you can... Fact check me on this one in terms of dates because I'm okay. always getting it's like 2010, 2011 okay. when that happened, and um, the goal was simply to be able to give uh, individuals, businesses, top quality advice and in, in consulting you know, to be able to grow their businesses. Mm -hmm. So I focused and, and specialized in um, growth and turnaround and strategies. Mm -hmm. um, I was a numbers person. I can build financial models for anything, any. I can take anybody's business and go and find a way in which to go in to improve it. Mm. Right? But I can also back it with actual numbers. Yep. Hey, if you do these things, these are the results that you should see. Mm. Right? But then always giving that ability in which from an operational perspective to use that financial model to go and put the real reality and go and mm. say, okay, hey, what variables were off? Because if you don't know how to adjust the variables in your business as it's moving forward, you can't be successful. <coughs> and so I wanted to give that base, that base financial model Right, to be able to show and have that ability. And that really became my, my focus. Um, but in that, what ended up happening is I ended up becoming more of a brand builder. Um, company. An accident, you said, right? It was an accident. Yep. Yeah. It was, um, you know, because you, it's the first thing that people see. And for myself, when I built my brand, the Northlight brand, it was everything. It was my, it was all of me. Yeah. And it, 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 it was personal. It was... And to me, when you build something, a brand, it also gives you that little bit of a connection that keeps you focused. Mm -hmm. You don't have to, because um, you want to keep it. Yeah. Right? You want to yeah, see yeah. that brand successful. You want to see people and you want them to know. Um, but at the end of the day, does that brand allow and in, in, in is an ethos of who you are? Yeah. And so with each one of my clients, you know, going through and creating a new brand or rebranding, uh, the current brand became part of this, the process. Mm. And, 
you know, we would go through that in the, the whiteboarding and we go through the entire process in which to go and say, okay, how do we do this? And then I would mm-hmm. bring in the proper designers and I would just project manage and go and say, okay, how do we do that? And how do we mm-hmm. make that move? And, um, you know, that became the focus and what I did. But one of the things that I realized in myself is one thing that I was really bad at mm-hmm. is asking people to pay me money. That is my biggest problem. I swear. It yeah. is. It, because at the end of the day, when you're doing something that you're passionate about, it's not for the money. Mm-hmm. Right? You do it because you love it. Mm. And to me, that's authentic. That's the real. And I had worked with so many different consulting firms and, and large organizations. I mean, the, the state of Maryland uses my documentation for anybody who wants to get money from the state of Maryland. Wow. The, the comptroller of Maryland came to the company, which I was doing a project for, to go and ask me personally, mm-hmm. hey, this is the best documentation that we have ever seen. Wow. Can we use this as a standard? And uh, I mean, me, I mean, like I'm 28 years old. I'm thinking to myself, yeah, of course. <laughs> Thank you. <Yeah. laughs> you know, they, and interestingly enough, uh, that because of my knowledge in, of numbers, um, it turned out that that company was actually embezzling. The, mm-hmm. the owner of that company was embezzling and, and he didn't want to accept the deal from the state of Maryland because mm-hmm. he also knew that if he was going to st- accept this money that he was going to start, people would be paying attention to his numbers. Yeah. And so he, he didn't. And the deal that I'd gotten from for the state of Maryland, the comptroller says the best deal. He actually got angry at me because I was able to negotiate such a great deal from the state mm-hmm. and show them a real case. And the reason why this company, this manufacturing company that did $28 million uh, in Laurel, Maryland would be able to get this money out of them, mm-hmm. to keep jobs here in Maryland versus sending them to another country, another uh, state. Right. Right. Um, so your, your thing is just, it's very numbers based, right? Yeah. Um, so it's very, very logical. So logic explains a lot of things to you. Right. Is there anything that logic doesn't explain? Everything. <laughs> At all. So I, emotions. It, it, yeah. Because, yeah, you can go and you can take and create a number in a, in a box and you can create a financial model and go and say, if this, then this. Yeah. Right? But this is the same reason why when you look at econom- uh, economists and meteorologists, they can be wrong majority of the time and still have a job. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was actually one of the reasons w- when I went to college. By the way, I never finished college. I have an associate's degree. Mm. Uh, that took me 10 years to get. Okay. Um, but I love the economics classes, mm. macro and micro, because to me it was, it was everything. Mm. It, it had to do more with uh, our emotions, yeah. right, in our, in our relationships to others. Mm. Because the decisions that we make are based out of our love, right, and or the negative, the opposite of that, right, hate, or apathy mm-hmm. um, that allows us and makes us to make the decisions that we do. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the biggest one that comes on top of all of that is fear. Yep. Right. And that's the reason when you go and you make any type of economic policy, monetary policy, um, people are flabbergasted when it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Wait, we go in and did this and, and it, no one accepted and, or moved forward and that the result mm-hmm. wasn't what we thought it was. Well, because every single person individually is making a decision based on the information they're giving and how they see that information. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I can go and kind of connect that to the automotive industry. You know, our main business, mm-hmm. uh, you know, is a product that, that focuses on incentives. Right? We go and we, we look at all of the incentives from all the manufacturers and we display those, ma- those incentives on dealership websites in different ways in which to get people to Mm-hmm. interact with it yep. to engage with those, those things and manufacturers spend millions of dollars every single month just to d- understand what incentives are going to get people to buy their cars mm-hmm. yet when you go and you look at each individual uh manufacturer in in that area you can go and say it was like why is it that cdjr in a in a market that has that's going gangbusters, mm-hmm. they're still da- discounting their cars and they have these lower interest rates than the other, other manufacturers. That doesn't make sense if you are Ford, mm-hmm. but for CDJR, they want and know that they are 
lagging in the market and they want to grow in the market. Yeah. And so how do you do that? Incentives, right? But then the factors that go into the reasons why you have to create those incentives is because the perceptions of the individuals that see those brands. Perceptions is huge. Right? Mm -hmm. And and so until you understand how someone perceives you, mm -hmm. right, you can't understand how they react to you in the way that they're reacting. Yep. You know, and I can go and take that personally. I mean, I have been a person that my fr my best friends would tell me, I thought you were an asshole until I got to know you. Yeah. And I realized that you were one of the most loving people that I've ever met. Yeah. Even today. <laughs> I mean, like, I yeah. am a person that you either love or you hate. Mm. Or you just don't know, don't know me at all. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But that's just how it is. Is it because of the way I look? Is it the way that I looked at you? Is it the way that I'm dressed? Right? Yeah. What is it that the thing that makes you feel that I am an asshole? Yeah. Right? Because you don't know me. Mm -hmm. But then you go and talk to people that do know me, and they know that I would give them the shirt on my, off my back. Mm -hmm. So that same thing goes, and, and so the perception that you have of me and how you're going to react to me mm -hmm. is based on how you perceive me. Of course. Right? Mm -hmm. But if I go and I take and and go into my wallet and pull out a $20 bill and hand it to you out of nothing, out of nowhere. I'm going to think you're a great guy. Right? Yeah. Or you can just, or simply maybe I have a lot of money. Yeah. Or you want something out of me or, or it depends as well. Right? Yeah. So it's a, it, and so when you're going and you're looking at brands and, and building brands and, and, and trying to structure and help a company grow, you have to go and know all of about them yeah. and how they are perceived and what that perception is. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, one example of that is I had a company, the company's name was Beekeepers. Okay. When you think of beekeepers, what is that to you? Beekeepers. Right? You're keeping bees, right? Yeah. You break down that and it's keeping bees. They didn't keep them. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't move them elsewhere. Yeah. They killed them. So the brand itself went against what they actually do. Yeah. The, the name attracted people to the company, mm -hmm. but then when they found out that it was not exactly, it was basically false advertising, mm -hmm. they wouldn't get referred, you know, continued business. And so mm -hmm. the business kind of stagnated. And so that was when we said, we, well, we, you, you need to change your brand. Mm -hmm. You need to do something different. Tell me about what you're trying to do and accomplish with your, with your business. Mm -hmm. And the, the owner of the company's name was Art. Um, he was, he was Armenian, mm -hmm. um, and he had, and he really cared about the earth. He really cared about people. Mm -hmm. He was just a loving, loving person. And, you know, we went through back and forth and all of a sudden one day as we we're talking, I go and say, Arteryx. Mm -hmm. He's like, Arteryx? What does that mean? I said, your name's Art. Terra mm -hmm. means Earth. Nix means destruction. Okay. Right? And so what it does is you're going and creating a balance between, you are trying to create a balance on the Earth. Mm -hmm. And part of that process is that you do have to destroy. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we created an entire brand around Arteryx, and it, they have been doing extremely well. Phenomenal, huh? Right? So here, here's my question Same to business. you Same business. Yeah. Just a different name. It's it's all about perception, and that's kind of where where branding comes into play. I'm not huge on branding. I, I do primarily marketing, um, and there's a lot of times where I've noticed that a company is not true to who they are, or they inflate themselves to be something that they're not, or even individuals. Like for example, um, I know many people that think that they they want they want the the faster things in life so they want to they want to look like they have nice cars they want to look like they have all these things that they honestly don't have so they brand themselves as somebody who has all these things when in reality that's not how you know they're actually operating that's not a thing that can last is what i'm assuming you not with not, a company not with a right it all comes out in the wash yeah yeah it all does you know and, and it, it's it's true and it but it's but when you go and you understand and recognize that and to me the way that I look at the world, the way I look at people, is everyone has value. Yeah. Right? It's just a matter of what value do you see in yourself. I love that. Because I can go and see and tell you, 
and I've done it with almost everyone in my company. Mm-hmm. Right. I remember one day, you know, talking about Justin, I told him, I said, I really truly believe that you, you should be a CMO. Mm-hmm. And I truly believe that you have that gift. Mm-hmm. And he, no. And we got in a huge argument and I fired him. Really? This yeah. Is this from, is from Milano. Yeah, for this, this is from like well, collective technologies, collective like technologies, like a year or so ago. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I definitely dealt with a lot of um, procrastination, m- split mind, and that's the thing. You you can't be split. You have to be very focused and determined and dedicated to one thing. one thing at a time and see that thing through. And so, going into our history, um, Brandon has known me since I was pretty much three years old. So yeah. kind of where I am in life was similar to where he was in life um, when he met my dad mm-hmm. and um, my dad came in and he was able to show um, a side of God, of God's character that was really refreshing to him in the period of life that he was going in. Mm-hmm. So um, pretty much after three till around like two, three years ago, um, kind of fell out, lived life, he lived life, I grew up. And then ever since, you know, this is kind of going now into my story and how I started with um, entrepreneurship and a business. I live in Loudoun County, so there's a lot of business owners here. Yeah, There are a lot of, there's a lot of money here. And so going to, let's say, different car meets. I never was really into cars growing up, but yeah. ever since I got my own, I was always wanting to make it look cooler because it was a Civic yeah. at the end of the day. It wasn't, yeah, yeah. It wasn't really anything. And so I would go to meets. I would see young people, people who were in their teens, barely 20 with expensive cars running their own businesses. And and for instance, specifically JR Garage um, was one of the guys who really, um, really, really influenced me to start looking into owning your own business because they I think they um, owned like a coin um, trading website that yeah. got them the success that they have um, in terms of being financially stable. And so they use that and they amplified their platform to now increase to where they are now, where they have a stable worth full of cars. And this was seeing this, it was very, very inspirational to me seeing it literally in front of my face. And my dad, before I had even thought about being an entrepreneur, he had called entrepreneurship out of me, pulled me out of public, uh, public school because he saw certain things that were going on and now he pretty much comes to the point of view where he thinks that the public school is the matrix pretty much. Yeah. Um, they program creativity out of you. They program certain, like, and they make you think a certain way. And we'll, we'll get into that later. So he called, he said, you're going to be an entrepreneur. I, I can tell you're going to be an entrepreneur. And mm-hmm. I had no idea what I wanted to do. Anyways, I started off doing drop shipping, you know. Well, actually, no. My we first started company. off doing drop shipping. Everybody <laughs> in this day and age, in the past like three years, started off doing drop shipping. But go ahead. Actually, before I started drop shipping, I created my first WordPress site. It was called A Four T R M R K T. So aftermarket. It was supposed to be a pretty much a website where you could buy, sell, and trade whatever aftermarket or new vehicle parts. And this was, I created it like when I was like 17, still in high school, Yeah, never made a sale off of it. But that, just that creativity, me getting my creativity out there, it was like, this is a path that I want to, to go upon. And, and ever since I put both feet in the door, I never really thought and looked back. Like my father, I'm, I'm very thankful to my parents that they never really forced college upon me. Once mm-hmm. they realized that I was going to be into entrepreneurship, they were okay with me figuring out that journey. However, my parents aren't entrepreneurs. So brand, uh, Brandon is. And so my dad connected me with him. He's like, he pretty much said, he said, I've raised him up to the point where I can't help anymore. Brandon, this, could you please take over essentially? Yeah. And I've learned so much. I've learned so much. I've, I've, <laughs> yeah, yeah I've, I've definitely matured. And, just seeing the ups and downs of running a business is truly something that a lot of people do not factor in when they think about running a business because social media, as I say all the time, it, it glorifies running a business and makes it seem yeah. very easy. No, no, he, he can tell that he can tell you that. But um, yeah, 
going back to last year, I, I'd gotten to a point where um, we were not communicating our um, frustrations, I guess, with each other, with the progress of the company. And I got to the point where, you know, um, I was working another job, uh, laziness, let's be honest, yeah. got to, to me and also pride. And so, um, you know, he did what he had to do in his position. And during the summer, um, I had originally, um, like I'm always thinking of different business ideas. So I was working on um, essentially a online platform and, and we'll, we'll get into that at a different time. I was working on an online platform similar to my previous idea aftermarket. Okay. Um, but I was going to make it into an app. Brandon, however, um, he saw what I was trying to do. He realized I was, I was still, you know, how, what I'll actually ask you this, what made you, uh, want to reinvest in, into my life? Obviously I know, but for the people who I don't never know, stopped. You, yeah, the honest is I never stopped. Because when your father, you know, came to me and said, you know, can you take over? To me, that was serious. Yeah. That was real. It was something that I, it was, it was, if I said yes, I had to now commit not to just that day, mm -hmm. but to the rest of your life. Because to me, he was asking me to be your godfather, to be your guy, to be a person that would always continue to be authentic and to be real and would tell you what you needed to hear even when I didn't even want to say it. Right. Because I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to hurt anyone. But at the end of the day, to love somebody well, you have to be willing to tell them when they're, fa when they're falling short. Yeah, right. You know, that moment, that time when I had to, to, when I realized that at the end of the day that I needed to fire you, it wasn't because I wanted to. It's because I knew that's what you needed. Right. You needed to go back out into the world. You had to go and see and to really figure out for yourself what you wanted. And I had to rely wholly that God was going to guide you and to put you on the right path and that I was going to love you through it. And, and so to me, is it, there was always, it was, it's always been that way. It, anyone who I have disagreed with, anyone I have had an argument with, I don't do it for any other reason, but I love them. Yeah. Because to me, that's the way that we're called. We are one family. This world is one family. We are in connected with this world in this life. And one of the biggest reasons why we live where we are in the middle of the woods, yeah. <laughs> you know, with chickens and other animals and trees and plants and all of that stuff is because that's, a, that's where we get connected and we realize and that we're here. When we're in the city, when we're, you know, where I was in Tyson Corner living most yeah. of my life, it's, it's a, it's, superficial world it's a fake world it's absolutely. not real absolutely and i knew that you needed that for yourself that you had to go and realize that i wasn't your enemy i don't know how many times i would go and say it's like i'm not your enemy yeah right you're your I'm enemy for you yeah right yeah exactly i mean we are our worst enemies i mean absolutely. every single day do i wake up and go and say you do not deserve anything that you have absolutely absolutely right? and it's very insane to me because all the so Here's the best way I'm going to say it. I'm around a lot of wealth, and it's not difficult to be around a lot of wealth. You just have to want to be wealthy, A, for the right reasons, and B, again, just so if, if you know kind of what your goals are, then it's very easy to be around the right people because you just kind of attract them. And this is something I've, I've definitely noticed as well. And those who are either really wealthy or doing very good for themselves – they have just a, a very different character, a very different type of feel to them where you're like, this guy is just doing something different. Never in my life have I ever met somebody who was even slightly doing good for themselves that didn't just like helping people. And anybody who didn't like doing good for other people, who was doing good for him themselves, it didn't last a long time. It just never lasted. So those who always look up to God, and those, there's times in my life, even with my business, where I didn't know what I was going to do. I just went with the next step. And, you know, an example would be there was a service that I was providing, you know, a while back. And I didn't know how I was going to fulfill on that service. It was a crazy offer. It was a crazy promise. I was basically promising people, clients, having no idea what their sales process is, who their sales team is. I had no idea. I just said, I'll get you 
your calls booked and from that point forward i'll train you to get to the point where you can sell your product to those people um and i just didn't know how i was going to do it at all so i was getting myself these results because obviously i can you know i have a little more control over the things that i do i just didn't know where to go from that point forward so i was like all right screw it all right i'm gonna you know sell this product to this person worst case scenario i'll give them their money back worst case scenario right and kind of that's that's how i started my own brand too where it was just like i'm i'm good at marketing i'm good at what i do but can i really do it for other people when i don't have that much control over them and i'm assuming that that's also the same process that you have to go over sometimes where you have to listen to me in order for me to help you and that goes with everyone right family wife whatever children you have to listen to me right i have to have some type of authority over you and when somebody kind of pushes away from that authority that's when you're like i can't help you anymore there's not much I can do for you, right? So that's something that, that you obviously go through, right? Yeah, I mean, it, on the business side. And Everything and, and side. what you were talking about, you know, with Justin, it was exactly that. Yeah. You know, I can't control other people. Yeah. I can want for them what I want, right? But I can't. Yeah. And if I try, it will fall apart. Mm -hmm. And because at the end of the day, all you want, if you're looking for, Again, when we talk about business, we can talk about revenue, right? Short-term revenue, long-term revenue. Yeah. Right? It's easy to get short-term revenue. Yeah. It's easy to get somebody to give you money for something right now. Quick. Yep. Right? But can you get someone to give you money month after month after month yep. after month, yep. year after year after year? Mm -hmm. You have to be doing the right things. To, to have pride in what you do, you have to be authentic in what you do. And when you are, people will stay. Yeah. People will forgive you through your mistakes. Yeah. You know, in our business, we deal with dealerships on a regular basis and dealerships are hit by salespeople and people promising in the world on a regular basis. Yeah. And, you know, we'll go and we'll talk about our products to a dealership and, and, and when we immediately, we, and when it comes in a conversation and, and by the way, we don't have any contracts. Yeah. They immediately look at, wait, what? Yeah. We don't have contracts and we have clients that saved for five, six, seven, eight years. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean it's been a perfect road. Our best clients have, have wanted to leave multiple times. Mm -hmm. right? And it would have to go back. And so what is, have we done wrong that this is what you want to do? And usually every single time it comes back to is it's because of the relationship, mm -hmm. right? We go, we, we fall and become comfortable in the relationship <coughs> and yeah. And so now all of a sudden it comes, it goes back to a transactional business. And now at that point, it's simply either I'm getting the results. I'm not getting results, right? I have budget issues. I don't have budget issues, right? But then when you go back to that relationship and go and say, okay, what have we done wrong? How can we can improve? And how can we want you to want to share what we do with everybody else? Yeah. And that last part's actually one of the hardest parts, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, we talk about in the, in, and, and I'm learning about social media. I'm not really, I've never been a, a, an adopter of, of technology. You're a very private person from what I've seen. Extremely private, actually. Yeah. I, and, on and social it, media. And it's not even, it's not on purpose. Yeah. Um, I don't really, it's just, actually, really, at the end of the day, actually, biggest thing, if I'm going to be directly honest, low self-esteem. I think so. Um, imposter syndrome. Um, pick a word, you know, I, I, I'm losing the kind of the words I'm looking for. Yeah. But for me, I look at what my family has done and the things that the others around me have achieved. And I would always go and say, I'll never do something like that. Mm -hmm. I'll never right. accomplish. That's the first problem. Never. Yeah. Never say never. Yeah. Right. But I'll go and tell myself and realize, and I can go and I can, spur on other people and get them to do great things in their yeah. lives. But for me, it was one of those things. And actually this is where I would go and, and kind of connect with you know, what we said before where, you know, Terrence's father, I mean, <laughs> Justin, <laughs> Terrence's uh, Terrence. Yeah. Um, I would go and say he was that same exact person, right? He has the ability in which to speak life into people. Mm -hmm. Wow. And yet he continues to be second, mm -hmm. right? 
And you can go and say, gosh, he's just such a great, humble servant. Right? Mm-hmm. Serving others and, and not asking for anything for himself. And he'll go and continue to say, well, you know what? God continues to provide. And he has. Yeah. Right? But at the end of the day, how much and how many people could really benefit for hearing his voice, hearing his words? Right? But he doesn't. Mm. Not yet. Not yet. Because I've been working on it. Yeah. Right? Because to me, everyone's voice is worthy of being heard. Yeah. Everyone's voice. And that is one of the things that has made social media so powerful. Mm. Right? It's given a people a place in which to go and say, hey, you know what? I'm going to go and talk about a particular topic. I'm going to put it on social media and I'm just going to let it ride. Yeah. And most of the time, every single time you do something like that, that is edifying, that is, is going to be positive and, and uplifting to people. Mm-hmm. What's the response? Yeah. It's typically always good. But we also think at the same time that's the, that we have the connection with social media, of the instant gratification. Absolutely. Right? It's great. You could say one thing great one time. But can you say and do and have the actions to match over and over and over again? Consistency. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just had, you know, I just had lunch with my, my friend Rick. Uh, and Justin's met Rick. And he has been someone who has done amazing things in this world. And, is, yeah. and, and, and things that you don't, you, 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 most people who have a car use the technology that he created. Mm-hmm. You don't know it. Of course. Right? But that's also the kind of person that he is. Yeah. It's not about him. Right. You know, and, and so, but he goes and makes it and chooses and gets involved in people's lives and to say, you know, I mean, I had a conversation with yesterday and he told me about basically depression mm-hmm. and, he's, and, 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 and these negative thoughts that he's taking. He's in his 60s. Mm-hmm. You'd think by this point that in his 60s that he would be able to to be able to have control and to recognize I'm just keep put one foot in front of the other and yep. you're going to be fine. But yet he still battles those things where the point he's told me, he's like, I didn't want to get out of bed. Mm-hmm. And then he turns around to me and goes, you know what? I thank you for our relationship that I can go and have this opportunity, this outlet to be able to talk about what's real. Yeah. You know? And so for me, that's kind of what I've always focused on and said, like, be real. Yeah. I'm going to give you the true person that I am. I'm going to tell you how I feel. And when I come across in a, in, in, in a, in a hurtful way or a, a negative way, I'm going to come to you and I'm going to say, please forgive me. Yeah. And I will go and tell you that that is probably the, one of the biggest things that men struggle with. Struggle with. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. But actually you said struggle, so I'm going to stop and I'm going to ask you, what does that mean to you? Why does why do you say that? Why do you agree and in, in, in specifically use the word struggle? Well, as far as being able to um, apologize to someone, it's more of a pride thing. I, I feel like there's a lot of people mm. that have a lot of pride in this world, especially men, actually. Where I've I've dealt with this actually a, a few times, where I had a few partners who had their own exact business, and they were like, "Join me." I was like, "No, I'm too good. Why would I join you? I have my own stuff going on. I'm way too good." Why would I have, why would I be under somebody when I can be the, the, the boss, right? So it is a pride thing. And it's always been a pride thing. And that's something I still struggle with till this day where I have so much. And the thing is, it's not always bad to have pride at all. To have pride of who you are and to have morality is always great. Because if you don't have pride or morality, nothing means anything. Mm-hmm. Who cares, right? Go out, do whatever you want. Live the life you want. Don't worry about your family. They'll deal with their own stuff. But if, if you have pride or morality, then your name means something. Agreed. You can, you can say, hey, listen, this is my family, my family. I'm not going to let my mother go out at night in a random street that I don't know anything about. I'm going to check up on them. I'm going to make sure they're all well. Even if I'm across the world, I will wake up at night, be in their time zone, check up on them the time that they need to be checked up on. And that's how I'm going to continue to live my life because that's how I was born. And that actually means something. Otherwise, if I'm working for myself, I don't care. I generally don't care about, like, not that I don't care for myself, but I don't care to work for myself. Everything that I do is for everyone else. And I'm, I'm a people pleaser as, as, as much as I want to say. And I, 
I do dislike being a people pleaser sometimes because it has its negatives, but the negatives outweigh the positives, even though it doesn't really seem like it sometimes. I've given so many people free things, right? People will come to me and say, uh, can you build me a free website? I'm like, that's not the service that I do, but yeah, I could build you a free website. Why not? Um, or can you build me a website? And I'll just give it to them for free because I don't, I don't charge for website building. I'd hate for you to go to a company, they charge you up the ass and they take all your money or a lot of your money to build you something that I can build you within a few minutes, right? So that's the process that I've been through. And I've, I've built, you know, I've done so many things for so many people and I've asked for absolutely nothing back. And that's because even with my own clients, sometimes, you know, you've raised prices before, right? You've said, you've looked at a product and was like, okay, this is a higher price. It's always that like nerve wracking thing where it's like, should I even be asking them for this? I can do it for this and still be profitable, but should I even raise the price? And then you're kind of battling against yourself and saying, no, I'm worth, this product is worth this much. We have this many clients. We should be raising the prices. And I, I, I don't like being the guy that's like, give me more money. Cause I don't, I don't need, I don't care about the money. Money means nothing to me. And even like, there was a few times when I told you I'm around wealth, I have a lot of friends who have extremely nice cars and that's how it works. So whenever I do them favors or anything like that, they sometimes just give me the car and say, go with it. Extremely nice cars. And I would be driving it alone and I would feel absolutely nothing. I'd be like, I don't like this. This is, I want to share this with people and I want to be around people when I'm doing this, but I don't want to do it to say I'm better than you. I just want to do it just because I want to share this with people. This means absolutely nothing to me. If I was the only single, if I was the only being in this world, I wouldn't care about any of these things. I wouldn't care about cars. I wouldn't care about anything fancy if I was the only one. So without even realizing, all of us are doing this to prove something to somebody else and to try to prove ourselves to other people when in reality, it, it just doesn't matter. Yeah. It really doesn't matter because... Yeah. You know, I'm 22, July, I'm going to be 23. So even yesterday, I was, I was in my house and I was thinking, I was like, damn, this, this went by quick. This went by really quick. I just went, I prayed and I was like, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not, I'm going to live every single second. I'm going to live every single second. And I'll try to help out those who I can. If, you know, one day I happen to get married and I have a daughter and she wants the nicest house in the world and the nicest cars, I will give that to her no matter what it is. You won't? Nope. Ever? Nope. Really? I wouldn't give that to my son. I'd give it to my daughter. Absolutely not. How come? There's a reason why we live where we are. Uh Uh-huh. Right? I want my children to struggle. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't want my daughter to struggle. I want my son to struggle. Uh, I'll I'll throw my son out in the wild. Really? Both. How come? Women rule the world. Yeah. I've said this on my podcast. (laughs) I have a clip of this. You do? (laughs) Yeah. They do. They're in charge of culture, everything. Yeah. It is your job as a father to make sure they know that. Yeah. My, when I go and I see Landon, Alana interact. Yeah. And I go and see the things in which that Alana believes that she can do. Mm -hmm. Who is it my job to go and to say that she can't? It's my job to make sure that the, the injury or the, the, the negative outcome that may come from it is minimized. Of course. But they only know what they're possible. They only know what they're capable of if they've already done something similar. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You can't go up to uh, for a, a barbell that has 405 pounds on it and mm-hmm. lift it. <clears throat> think that you can lift it without doing something before with have, have doing things up to that point in which to be able to achieve it. Mm-hmm. Right. And so we learn that through, all of the little things, mm-hmm. those little struggles. Yep. I do not, I don't even pick up my daughter to go up the stairs since she was a baby. Mm-hmm. I take her down the stairs because that's the, the more yeah. dangerous of the two things. Yeah, yeah. But I don't because I want them to experience and know what it is to raise a family. Mm-hmm. But to, to raise a family that is going to do something positive for the world. And if you don't know how to exist in the world, if you do not know how to, to plant a garden and how to a crop to grow, mm-hmm. how can you have thankfulness, true thankfulness, when you sit at the dinner table around food that you did not, didn't, you did not create? Mm-hmm. Right? You have course, to know powerful. where those things come yeah. from. And so you cannot do that without allowing a child to struggle. Mm-hmm.